Johan, welcome. Hey, Jason. It's good to be with you. I apologize in advance to your listeners if I speak too fast. I've drunk enough caffeine to kill a whole field of cows today, so I'm sorry. <laughs> all, all, all good. I'll segue. You know, the title of the book is Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention and How to Think Deeply Again, and caffeine can play a role in either direction, so all, all good. <laughs> I'm not normally a caffeine head that badly, but it's uh, in the middle of book promotion. All good. Well, I, I, I love the book. I think it's a really important book, and I'm going to start off with a, a pretty uh, alarming stat that you have in the book. In the U.S., teenagers, I was like, wow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this one slowly. In the U.S., teenagers can focus on one task for only 65 seconds at a time, and office workers average only three minutes. It, I, when I read that, I said, like, wow, like in terms of our focus, those are some pretty bad numbers. So I, I know it's a big question, but at the highest level, what do you think is driving these alarming numbers in terms of our focus or our lack of ability to focus? This is the journey I went on for the book because I noticed my own ability to pay attention was getting worse. It felt like with each year that passed, things that required deep focus that were really deep to my sense of myself, like reading a book, watching long movies, were getting more and more like running up a down escalator. Do you know what I mean? I could still do them, but they were getting harder and harder. And I started looking at some of the evidence and I was quite kind of taken aback by some of what I learned. But I also thought, oh, doesn't every generation think this, right? Your mind deteriorates and you mistake your own, as you get older, and you mistake your own deterioration for the deterioration of humanity. But it was really looking at some young people in my life who seem to be kind of whirring at the speed of Snapchat where nothing still or serious could touch them. And particularly one person I really love, young person, who we can talk about if you like, where I just thought, you know, I really, I think I should start looking into whether there is something deeper happening here. So across three years, I traveled all over the world from Miami to Moscow to Melbourne. And I interviewed over 200 of the leading experts on attention and focus. And I studied their research in great detail. And I learned that there's scientific evidence for 12 factors that can make your attention better or make it worse. And loads of the factors that can make your attention worse have been significantly rising in recent years, which is why I concluded that we're living in a real attention crisis. The way Professor Joel Nigg, one of the leading experts on attention in the country, in the United States, or I interviewed in Portland, Oregon, put it to me, is we need to ask if we now have what he called an attentional pathogenic culture, a culture that is systematically undermining our ability to pay attention across the board. And the crucial thing for people to understand is if you can't focus, if you can't pay attention, if you're struggling, if your kids are struggling, this is not your fault. This is happening to almost all of us. Your attention did not collapse. Your attention has been stolen from you by some very big and powerful forces. And we're going to have to respond in two ways. One way is we have to protect ourselves at an individual level and our kids at an individual level. And there's all sorts of changes we can make to do that. But we're also going to have to take on the forces that are doing this to us. Because at the moment, it's like someone is pouring itching powder over us all the time. And then that person has leaned forward and said, hey, buddy, you might want to learn how to meditate, then you wouldn't scratch so much, right? And it's like, yeah, I'll learn to meditate, but you need to stop pouring the itching powder on me. And we need to, and so a big part of the book is figuring out, well, how do we take on these bigger forces that are invading our attention? I love that phrase, attentional pathogenic culture. It was so chilling, you know, Jason, it was so chilling because at the start, you know, I had these suspicions that things were bad. But when you, when you go and interview really distinguished experts and they show you the science, I never forget going to interview Professor Earl Miller, who's one of the leading neuroscientists in the world. And him explaining to me for reasons we'll probably discuss later, he said to me, that we live in a perfect storm of cognitive degradation. I'll never forget Professor Barbara de Menis, who's a leading French scientist. She's won the, the Légion d'honneur, which is the, the biggest civilian award you can get in France. Her saying to me, there's no way we can have a normal brain today. And it, it just sort of knocks you back a bit when you first, in some ways there's a relief. You're oh, it's not just me. Then there's a sort of moment of being profoundly daunted. You're like, oh, this, is, this really is being done in a deep and structural way to so many of us. And then there's a moment of hope because once you understand what's happening, 
then you can begin to fight back. But if you're just lost in an overly simplistic story, like the, the way I was, which I just thought, oh, I'm weak, I don't have willpower, I'm not strong enough. Once you get the more deep and complex story, you can begin to build defenses individually and collectively. So what are some of those major forces contributing to our d decline? Yeah, so they, one of the things that's interesting is that when I say to people, I wrote this book about why people can't pay attention, most people say, oh, you wrote a book about tech, right? And what's, there are aspects of our tech that are designed to profoundly invade our attention and are having a horrific effect on us. That is true. But actually what surprised me is of the 12 factors, I don't think tech is the biggest. I'll give you an example of one straight away that I think everyone, when you hear it, it's a bit of a no, shot, no shit Sherlock insight, but I think it, we're not, we know this at some level, but we don't live by it. Um, so only 15% of us wake up feeling refreshed. There has been an enormous decline in sleep. We sleep an hour less than we did in 1942. Children sleep 85 minutes less than they did a century ago. And I spent a lot of time interviewing the leading experts on sleep in the world. One of them is a guy called Dr. Charles Seisler, who's at Harvard Medical School. Totally amazing guy. You should have him on your podcast. It's a great guy. Uh, and he's made a whole series of breakthroughs in the understanding of sleep. And he advises everyone from the Boston Red Sox to the US Secret Service. And he found that if you stay awake for 19 hours, which doesn't feel like very long, your attention deteriorates to the same level as if you had got legally drunk. Or if you, it's staggering. If you just go 10 days with only six hours sleep a night, you get to the same state. And he did this experiment. There were so many things he discovered that chilled me, but there was this, he did this experiment that really uh, struck me. It's very simple. He was the first person to combine two technologies to study sleep. There's a technology that can track your eyes to see what you're looking at. And there's obviously, we all know, a technology that can scan your brain. So he put this together. So he's looking at what people are looking at and he's looking at their brain. And what he discovered is you can appear to be awake. You can be talking just as surely as I'm talking to you. And yet whole parts of your brain can literally have gone to sleep. It's called local sleep because it's local to one part of the brain. So you appear to be awake, but you are actually partially asleep. And it's really important to understand why this is so important for attention. One of the people who explained this to me is Professor Roxanne Prichard, who's at the University of Minneapolis, where I interviewed her. And Professor Prichard explained to me, when you're sleeping, you're repairing. Your brain is cleaning itself. Your cerebral spinal fluid channels, they open, a watery fluid rinses through them, and all the, what she calls brain cell poop that builds up throughout the day, the metabolic waste, is washed out of your brain and taken down to your liver and exits your body. If you don't sleep, that repairing process doesn't happen. Your brain is literally clogged up with waste. You can't think as well. You can't pay attention as well. In children, that will manifest largely as mania running around. Dr. Seisler said to me, even if nothing else had changed, that the, the decline in sleep alone would be causing us a very serious attention crisis. But of course, and that's just one of the 12, but this combines with the other factors in a way that's particularly harmful. So if you have a night where you can't sleep, you're wound up, you're manic in the way that so much of our, our culture makes us, and the next day you're really tired, you'll be much more vulnerable to these technologies that are already designed to hack and invade our attention. I was just speaking to someone who you know, couldn't sleep and had spent the whole of the next day obsessively scanning the news about this tennis player in Australia. Is he called Djokovic? Whatever it is. Djokovic, yeah. yeah. The, the, sorry, I know nothing about sports. <laughs> I, I'm very yeah, big controversy in, exactly. in Australia right now. Exactly. I've sort of seen it out of the corner of my eye, but I, I yeah, the, so many of these factors reinforce each other to create a kind of negative spiral, uh, which is why we've got to start unpicking them step by step in sleep. And, you know, Professor Prashad also said to me, you know, of course you can cut back on sleep temporarily. As a species, we would never be able to raise children or escape hurricanes if we couldn't cut back on sleep. But what happens is when you cut back on sleep, your body interprets it, interprets it as an emergency. It thinks, oh, something's really wrong here. And so it does all sorts of things. It shuts down the parts of your brain that are more creative, that are more free associative. It raises your blood pressure. It raises your heart rate. It, it makes you crave more sugary, carby snacks uh, to keep your energy levels up. But what's happening is a very large proportion of us are living in that bodily emergency, which, which of course is disastrous for your long-term attention and focus. It's why one of the biggest causes of death in the entire United States now is drowsy driving. 
Yeah, you, you know, I have a couple of thoughts. So, you know, one, you mentioned be staying up for 19 hours, uh, equating to be legally drunk. And then I, I think of, you know, my early 20s when I would stay up for 19 hours and be legally drunk on top of that and, and, <laughs> and all the very poor decisions I, I made. And, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. But <laughs> But it's serious. I'm sure you made some good decisions as well. We were talking I, I, I about how know. much time you spent in Vegas. What, so. what, what's that? What's that great? There's, there's a, a cliche or a great line, if you will, like nothing good happens after insert time. Nothing good happens <laughs> after 9 p.m., 10 p.m. You know, back then for me, it was like nothing good happens after 4 a.m. or what have you. But at any rate, I've done a lot of growing since then. So, you know, you, you mentioned distraction and you know, c can you talk about multitasking? You know, you just mentioned driving and you also say in the book that distracted driving. So like texting when you're driving, being distracted driving is one of the fastest growing causes of death in the world. Yeah. Can we talk about multitasking? <laughs> and yeah, like, that's pretty yeah. horrific. And you see it all the time. You're driving, someone's on their phone. It's like, it, it's worse than it, being drunk in some respect. It, it, so there's a guy called Professor David Shaler at the University of Utah who's done a lot of research on this. Obviously, they have to research it in driving simulators, not on the road because they're a bit, a bit dangerous. And yeah, they sh it shows that distracted driving is as dangerous as being drunk. And this connects to a much wider thing that is invading the attention of everyone listening to this, I'm sure. To some degree, it'll vary for people, but everyone will have some effect. And it comes back to that guy I mentioned before, Professor Earl Miller, one of the leading neuroscientists in the world. So I went to interview him and he said to me, look, there is one thing you've got to understand about the human brain more than anything else. You can only consciously think about one or two things at a time. That's it. The human brain has not significantly changed in 40,000 years. It ain't going to change on any time scale. You and me are going to see you can only think about one or two things consciously at the same time. But we have fallen for a mass delusion. The average teenager now believes they can follow seven forms of media at the same time. So what happens is Professor Miller's colleagues get people into labs and they get them to think they're doing lots of things at the same time. And it feels easy. It feels like while I'm talking to you, Jason, my phone is hidden behind my laptop. It feels like if I reach behind my phone, I glanced at my text messages while you're talking. That feels like a very small thing. It turns out it comes with a huge cost. So when you get people to do, think they're doing lots of things at the same time, what scientists always discover is in fact, you're juggling. You're switching very rapidly between tasks, you're alternating, refocusing, refocusing. And it turns out that comes with a really big cost. The cost is called the switch cost effect. And it basically means that when you try to do lots of things at once, you do all of them less competently. You make more mistakes, you remember less of what you do, and you're far less creative. And again, that sounds like a small effect, but I, I was there, there's lots of research on this showing it's really substantial, but there's one study, a small study, that really helped it land for me. Hewlett Packard, you know the printer company? who are, I, I, a tense up when I say their name because the words paper jam are the worst words in the English language. But anyway, <laughs> Hewlett Packard did a, got a scientist in to do a little study with their workers. What the scientist did is he split their workers into two groups. The first group was told, just do whatever your task is for the day and you're not going to be interrupted. And the second group was told, do whatever your task is, but you've got to answer a heavy load of email and phone calls, which is very common to all of us now. And at the end of it, they tested the IQ of both groups. The group that was not interrupted scored 10 IQ points higher than the group we didn't. To give you a sense of how big that effect is, if you or me, Jason, sat together now and smoked a fat spliff and got stoned, our IQs would go down by five points. So at least in the short term, you'd be better off sitting at your desk, getting stoned and doing one thing at a time than you would sitting at your desk, not smoking any cannabis and just being constant and being periodically interrupted. That's how bad these interruptions are for you. The, the Professor Michael Posner at the University of Oregon discovered that if you're interrupted, it when it can be something as small as a text message, it takes you on average 23 minutes to get back to the level of focus that you had before you were interrupted. But most of us never get 20 minutes spare. The average Fortune 500 CEO only gets 26 minutes to himself a day. So we're all operating at this degraded level of thought and focus as a result of these constant interruptions. Does that ring true to you, Jason? Does that I, I, absolutely, absolutely. And in the book, you reference Adam Ghazali, who we've had mm. on this, who we've had on oh, the show. And, and he, he's just such a trip. And he likens it, I love this, he likens our brain to being a nightclub bouncer. This illustrates another one of the causes that I write about. 
I, I really like Professor Ghazali. I interviewed him in San Francisco and in the pre-plague days, the before times. And it was fascinating. So this illustrates one of the other causes, which is that human, all hu in most situations, unless you're in an isolation tank, we're all filtering things out. So I'm speaking to you now, but I could, I can see the traffic outside my window. I can hear the heater at the other side of my room. I know my phone's behind my laptop. I'm filtering all that out and I'm just focusing on you, right? And we're all, everyone listening, you're filtering out something, right? If you're listening to this podcast while walking down the street, you're filtering out a lot of things to listen to this. Hopefully not the traffic because we don't want you, this to be the last thing you ever hear, but you're filtering out a lot of things. And filtering takes a certain amount of mental energy. Our brains are incredibly good at filtering. You know, you can be in a very, you can be in the middle of Grand Central Station at rush hour and you can listen to the person next to you and filter out everyone else to a certain degree. But filtering requires a significant amount of brain power. We know this because, the, I mean, there's many ways we know this, but children, for example, who are in noisy classrooms learn less than children who are in quiet classrooms. Filtering takes mental energy and it takes it away from the other things you might want to be doing. And the way Professor Ghazali puts it is you've got to picture the part of your brain that filters the frontal cortex prefrontal cortex, sorry, picture it like a nightclub bouncer, right? It's a really strong nightclub bouncer. It's ripped. It can fight off 10 people who want to break their way into the nightclub, but it can't fight off 20. It can't fight off 30. And to a degree, we are being overwhelmed with the things we have to filter out in many, not in all environments we're in, but in many of the environments we're in. It's another factor for why we, a big part of what we need to get, need to do to get our attention back is actually to narrow the amount of things we're exposed to. So to build off that, how do we narrow the things we're exposed to? So I think there's several levels at which we have to do this. There's an individual level and there's a collective level. So for each of the 12 causes that I write about in Stolen Focus and present the evidence for, there's this double level at which we've got to think about it. So let's think about an individual level. Obviously, I go through dozens of things we can do about an individual, but let's think about that one cause distraction and filtering and what we can do at an individual level. I'll give you one example. You can't see this because of the angle of my camera, but in the corner of the room there, I have something called a K-safe. These people should so be paying me commission because I mention them in every interview. So a K-safe is a plastic safe. It's very simple. You take the lid off, you put your phone in, you put your lid on, you put the lid on and you turn the dial and it will lock away your phone for anything between five minutes and a whole day. I also have on the laptop I'm speaking to you on, I have an app called Freedom that can cut you off and will cut you off from the internet or specific sites for however long you tell it to, for anything from five minutes to, I think it's more than a day. I use that, I use both of these every day for four hours. At first it was very painful. And over time, the benefits of getting my focus back outweighed the pain of the desire to smash the safe and get back to it. That's one of dozens of things I talk about in the book. But I also, I think my book in some ways is quite different to other attention books. Because I really want to be honest with people. There are lots of things you can do to improve your attention at a personal level. But that will, and they are all worth doing, and I'm passionately in favor of them, but they will only get you so far because we are living in an environment that is profoundly invading our attention. And that is why we have to take on those forces. So that can sound a bit fancy, a bit abstract, a bit like, oh, woo woo. I'll give you a very concrete example in relation to that cause. In France, in 2018, they were having a big crisis with what they called le burnout, which I don't think I need to translate. And the French government was under pressure from labor unions. So they set up a government investigation to figure out, well, why are people getting so burned out? What's going on? And they discovered that 35% of French people, sort of French workers, felt they could never stop checking their email or put their phone on silent because their boss could message them at any time of the day or night. And if they didn't answer, they'd be in trouble, right? Now, I remember when we were kids, Jason, the only people who were on call were the president and doctors, and even doctors weren't on call all the time. Now nearly half the economy is on call all the time. It meant they couldn't sleep properly, they couldn't unwind, they couldn't give undivided attention to their children. It was burning people out. So the French government introduced a reform. It's very simple. It's called the right to disconnect. Every French worker legally has two rights. Your work hours have to be defined in your contract, and you have a legal right to never answer your phone or check email after your work hours are finished. So I went to Paris to see how this works. Just before I was there, Rent-A-Kill, the pest control company, 
got fined 70,000 euros because they tried to get their worker to answer his email an hour after he left work. Now, you can see how that's a big collective change, a very practical one. France isn't, you know, a science fiction story. It's France is a real place. Very nice. Got its flaws, but it's very nice. And you can see, I think that helps you to understand. And this, again, this will come up again and again with all the causes. There's an interaction between the individual solution and the collective solution, because you can see how giving people the right to disconnect frees them up to do loads of the things they want to do to protect their attention. Anyway, look, I can give you all the sweet self-help lectures in the world about why don't you unplug? Why don't you do what I do and take four hours off with your phone in a case up every day? But if your job, if you'll lose your job, if you do that, that doesn't sound like helpful advice. That sounds like a cruel taunt. It's like going up to a home person and saying, hey, buddy, you know what would make you feel better? Why don't you go into that fancy restaurant over there and have a steak? And it's like, well, I'd love to have a steak. I can't. And that's why we've got to change the way our society is working to free people up to make those individual changes. And those collective changes will only happen if we all fight for them, right? It happened in France because workers organized and demanded it. So here's the thing, the way I think about it, and, and I think you get to this in the book too, is, you know, there's defense and offense. So defense, if you will, is, you know, I'm going to carve out the time. I'm going to tune this out. I'm going to create a role. And then there's offense. It's like, then what do you do next? And I think my next data point from the book is going to illustrate this issue. You say a lack of reading is also contributing quote, the proportion of Americans who read for pleasure is at its lowest level recorded. 57% of Americans do not read a single book in a year. And the average American, this one, wow. The average American spends 17, 17, one, seven minutes a day reading a book versus 5.4 hours on their phone. So that's some of the problem. It's like, all right, we're going to take the time. And then said person gets bored and what they do, they go to their phone. And so you're able to crowd out some of the noise, but then you go, then we go to the phone. So you need both in your toolkit. So can you talk about, I was like, wow, the reading numbers, like what is, what's driving that? I love that way of putting it defense and offense. I wish I thought of that when I was writing the book, cause that's a really, that really cuts through to it. And you know, as you were saying that, I was thinking a lot about the moment that instigated me to write the book. So I've got a godson who I call Adam in the book. I've changed a few details about him because I didn't want to identify him. And when he was nine, he developed this <laughs> extremely cute and freakishly intense obsession with Elvis. I never understood why. Uh, I don't know where he, so he must have seen Elvis on the TV. And what was particularly cute is he didn't know that Elvis had become like a cheesy cliche. So he was kind of very sincerely singing like Viva Las Vegas and Suspicious Minds. He got me to keep telling him the story of Elvis's life again and again and again. I tried to skip the bit where he dies on a toilet at the end. Uh, and one night when I was tucking him into bed, he looked at me very intensely and he said, Johan, will you take me to Graceland one day? And I was like, sure, I'll take you to Graceland. And he's like, do you promise? Do you really promise? And I'm like, yeah, in the way that you promise children, because you know, tomorrow they'll want to go to like the zoo or whatever. And I never thought of that promise again until 10 years later when so many things had gone wrong. So he dropped out of school when he was 15. By the time he was 19, it's, this happened just on the sofa behind where I'm talking to you from. I remember one afternoon we were sitting there and it was like his consciousness had fractured. He spent almost all of his waking hours alternating between his iPad and his phone. Between His life was just this blur of YouTube, WhatsApp, Snapchat, porn. And I was sitting there and I was trying to get a conversation going all day. And I was looking at my own devices and feeling disgusted at myself because frankly, I wasn't that much better. And I suddenly remembered this moment from all those years before. And I said to him, hey, let's go to Graceland. And he was like, what? He didn't even remember this promise I'd made to him. And I was like, no, look, this is no way to live. Let's go to Graceland. Let's break this numbing routine. And I could see that it excited something in, in him. But I said to him, look, I'll take you. We'll go all around the South, but you've got to promise me one thing which is that when we go, you'll leave your phone in the hotel during the day because there's no point going if you're just going to be staring at your phone all day. And he promised. I'm sure he was sincere. Anyway, we landed in New Orleans a few weeks later and a few weeks after that, we got to, to Memphis. And when you arrive at the gates of Graceland now, this is even before COVID, there's no person to show you around. What happens is there's a, at the gates, they hand you an iPad and you put in earbuds and the iPad says, go left, go right, you know, and it narrates the room, tells you some history. 
So what happens is everyone just walks around Graceland staring at their iPad, barely looking up. And I'm walking around, I'm getting more and more kind of tense as I see this. And we got to the jungle room, which was Elvis's favorite room in the mansion. And there was a Canadian couple next to us. And the Canadian guy turned to his wife and he said, honey, this is amazing. Look, if you swipe left, you can see the jungle room to the left. And if you swipe right, you can see the jungle room to the right. And I thought he was joking. So I kind of laughed and I turned and him and his wife are just swiping back and forth. And I, and I looked at him and I said, but hey, sir, there's an old fashioned form of swiping you could do. You could just turn your head because you realize we're actually in the jungle room, right? You don't need to look at a, a, a digital representation of it. We're actually there. And they obviously thought I was insane and just backed away into the next room. And I turned to my godson to laugh about it, to say how funny it was. And he was just in a corner looking at Snapchat because from the moment we landed, he just could not stop. And I went up to him and I tried to snatch the phone off him. And I said, look, I know you're afraid of missing out, but this is guaranteeing you will miss out. You're not showing up to your own life. You're not present at your own life. And he stormed off as well. And I, I walked around Graceland on my own for a few hours. And that night I found him in the Heartbreak Hotel where we were staying across the street. And he was sitting by the swimming pool, which is shaped like a guitar. And he was just looking through his phone. And I went up to him and I apologized. And he was scrolling and scrolling. And he just said, I know something's really wrong. But I don't know what it is. And that's when I thought, okay, I need to look into this. I need to find out what's happening to all of us. And that degradation of consciousness that you're describing, the difference between a consciousness that evolves from reading books to a consciousness that evolves looking at Snapchat, which is not to say that young people aren't lovely, they are, it is very different. And there's lots of evidence that it's different in all sorts of ways. And in terms of attention in particular, what I could, I, there was a moment it fell into place with me in relation to my godson and more widely, and it was thinking, think about it in this way. Everyone listening, I would just say to them, think about something you've done in your life that you're proud of, whether it's learning to play the guitar, starting a business, being a good parent, whatever it might be. That thing that you're proud of took a huge amount of sustained focus and attention. And when attention and focus break down, your ability to achieve your goals and solve your problems breaks down. And it's almost like you become a kind of stump of yourself. You sense what you might have been if only you'd been able to apply yourself. And to me, that's why it's so important that we embark on this fight to restore our attention and take on these forces. I love the offense defense way of framing it. I'm going to, I'm going to use that from now on. I, I love it. And I, I want to stay on, you know, your godson and kids for a moment. You know, I, I'm a parent of two young girls, a, a five-year-old and a two and a half-year-old. And, you know, on one hand, look, technology is a big contributor, but it's not the only contributor. But as I hear your story and I think of kids, it seems to me like technology is kind of the elephant in the room. You know, if you think about in the book, you say 13% of adolescents are diagnosed and now given medication diagnosed with ADHD. Like as a parent, what do you do? What is your advice to parent of a child of any age with regards to technology, with regards to screen time, with, which, with regards to everything? Because I think we all want to do the right thing. We see it happening in the world. So what do we do? What do we do as parents? So there's a very practical thing I would recommend everyone do. And, and there's all sorts of things I go through. As you know, the last quarter of the book is about what's happening to our kids and how we can put it right. And there's a way of thinking about this that I think really helps. So you're absolutely right. There's been an enormous explosion in children being identified with attention problems. For every child who was diagnosed with serious attention problems when I was seven years old, there's now a hundred children being given that diagnosis. And for some kids, there's a biological contribution to their attention problems. That's very real. But we need to understand this in a much wider context because this collapse in children's attention has happened at the same time, not coincidentally, I believe, as an enormous transformation in childhood. So one of the heroes of my book, and I think the core of the solution, a big part of the core of the solution, there's many others, it comes from a woman called Lenore Skenazi, uh, whose story I tell in the book. Have you, have you had Lenore on your podcast? I haven't, but I, I know the uh, name. Yeah. You should, I'll introduce you if you want. I love, she's a completely love amazing person. Yeah, you should totally have her on. She's one of my heroes. So when Lenore was a kid in Chicago in the 1960s, she used to 
from when she was five years old, she would leave home on her own and she would walk to school on her own that was about 15 minutes away. I mean, she would usually bump into the other kids and they'd all walk together. When she got to the school, there was a 10-year-old boy whose job was to help the five-year-olds cross the street. She'd walk in on her own. School would finish at 3 p.m. She would leave on her own. She'd wander around the neighborhood and play freely with her friends. And then she'd go home when she was hungry around five or six. Anyone whose parents are around that age, ask them. That is what childhood was virtually everywhere in the world. That is how almost all human childhood has been. Children played freely with other children. By the time Lenore was a parent in the 1990s, she was living in Queens, uh, not far from where you are, that had virtually ended, right? By 2003, only 10% of American children ever played outside without adult supervision. So childhood was suddenly something that happened behind closed doors. And it turns out that transformation of childhood has a catastrophic effect on attention. Now, there's all sorts of reasons. I'll give you a real no shit Sherlock one. Exercise massively boosts attention. The single best thing you can do for kids who can't focus is let them go and run around. And we have prevented kids from running around. Children need to explore things. That's absolutely vital to developing a healthy mind. And the only place where we let our kids explore anything is on video games. The only experience that most kids get of roaming around is on Fortnite and games like that. Hardly surprising, they therefore become obsessed. Now, there's lots of other elements in this change that damage children's attention that we can talk about if you want. But Lenore is not just an expression of the problem. She is the heart of the solution. So Lenore is part of a group called LetGrow.org. Absolutely every parent listening, go now to LetGrow.org. It will change your children's lives. So Lenore realized there is no point telling parents individually, let your kids go out and play. Because if you're the only person who lets your kid go out and play, the kid gets frightened. In fact, some people call the police when they see a child on their own and it doesn't work, right? So what Lenore does, this group Let Grow that she runs, they go to whole communities, whole schools, whole neighborhoods, and they persuade all the parents to make, allow their children increasing levels of freedom and restore their childhood. So I went to Long Island to see several of these programs. It's one of the most moving experiences I've ever had. I'll give you one example. There was a 14-year-old boy who I spoke to in the program. He'd been in it for, I think, nine months. This was a big, strapping, physically strong 14-year-old boy. And until this program began, his parents had never let him leave his house on his own. They didn't even let him go for a jog around the block. Now, this area, they also have these programs in poor areas. I went to a poor area. But this area is the kind of neighborhood where the French bakery is across the street from the olive oil store. And when I said to him, why wouldn't your parents let you out? He said, oh, they're afraid of, I'll never forget the phrase he used. He said, they're afraid of all these kidnappings. I mean, he had a level of fear that would be appropriate if he lived in Syria at the height of the war. And he was living in a place where you are three times more likely to be struck by lightning than be kidnapped. Anyway, the program began and he was allowed out of his house, right? He would meet his friends in the street and near where they lived, there were some woods him and his friends went and they built a fort in the woods and their phones didn't work in the woods and they still went there because the joy of being physically present, of building something, of exploring an environment that you don't know was incredible to them and they had never known it. And when I saw this boy describing it, maybe this sounds over the top, but it felt like watching him come to life. And I thought about how many young people I know who don't ever get to leave their houses except in these highly supervised and controlled environments. And after he, we spoke to him, Lenore was with me that day. Lenore said to me, you know, think about human history. For all of history, young men and women learned to explore, to seek, to hide, to build things. And then we took all of that away from them in one generation. And that boy, given a tiny bit of freedom, went and built a fort. This is something really deep in us. So a key part of how we're going to help our children have attention is to give them back a childhood that your grandparents and my grandparents would have recognized as a childhood at all. Yeah. And not to harp on this one, because I think everyone gets it, but we're doing that. We're stealing the, the childhood from our children right now, you know, with COVID, with a lot kids need to be out. They need to be, need to be in school, but we're not going to Harp on but, that. But, but you know, Jason, it's really interesting because irrespective of the debate about COVID and wherever you stand on the debate in COVID, everyone agrees that this has been very harmful for children. The only debate is, did the benefits outweigh the harm? But I think one of the chilling things, to be honest, 
is that actually for a lot of children, although it was horrendous to be deprived of school, actually in their home lives, it wasn't as different as it should have been. Because by the t even when COVID arrived, we'd already put our children under house arrest, right? We already didn't let them out. So, and we've seen how bad that's been under COVID. The use of uh, the children, amount of time children spend on devices has doubled under COVID. We've got to, now we've got to deal with the tech itself through regulation. And there's all sorts of th or other personal protections we can put in place for the tech. And I'm happy to talk about them because the tech is designed to hack and invade your children explicitly for that purpose. And we can stop that happening. But we've also, we can't just take it away from them. We've got to give them something that is joyful and meaningful and boosts their attention, right? But this is not, deprivation-based diets don't work. I'm just going to cut out the things. What diet, the diets that work are the ones where you positively choose an alternative that you start to like. Let's build off that because you also say diet is contributing. So, so briefly, like how is diet contributing? How should we eat? If, if I want to eat for attention, how do I eat yeah, for attention? That would have been a good title for the book, Eat for Attention for that chapter. Uh, so I want to preface this by saying, this is one of the courses I learned about that I have really tried and I have completely failed on. I, you can't see this, but there is a KFC bucket behind my laptop so which i can see how healthy and glowing you are and i can sense your listeners are appalled i'm sorry but all good really it's a, it's a journey start wherever you are it, <laughs> yeah. it's, it is a journey and for me it's a journey to the nearest branch of kfc but hopefully there'll be a better journey in the future i interviewed a lot of people who are called nutritional psychiatrists it's this whole new movement and there are essentially three ways in which the way we eat is really harming our ability to focus and pay attention, particularly our children, but also all of us. The first is the way we eat causes huge spikes in energy and huge crashes in energy. So let's say for breakfast, you have white bread or Frosties, right? The kind of things I grew up eating for breakfast. What that does, and it was Dale Pinnock, one of Britain's leading nutritionists, who explained this to me, what that does is it releases a huge amount of energy really quickly and you feel great. You feel like you've woken up, right? But then you, an hour later, you get to your desk, your kid gets to their school desk, and suddenly your energy crashes and you experience brain fog, right? And your brain really starts to kick in again when you have another sugary, carby treat. Now, we are living on a roller coaster of surges of energy and crashes of energy. The way Dale put it to me is it's like we're taking a mini, you know, those small 1970s British cars. It's like we're putting rocket fuel into a mini, right? It'll go really fast for five minutes and then it'll just stop. So when you eat food that releases energy steadily throughout the day, a plant-based diet, porridge, oatmeal, sorry, there's all sorts of things that release energy steadily throughout the day, your attention will be much more level. There's two other ways it's affecting your attention. The diet we eat is depriving us of the nutrients that you need for your brain to develop properly. Things like omega-3s. Uh, and the third way is even more disturbing, which is it's not just that our food lacks the things our brains need in order to function. Our food contains chemicals, often contains chemicals that act on us like drugs. There was a study here in Britain in a place called Southampton in 2007. They took 297 kids and they split them into two groups. And the first group was just given water. And the second group was given a drink that contained lots of the E numbers and chemicals that exist in the foods we eat all the time. Food we get from the supermarket, M&Ms, all kinds of things. And then they were monitored and the kids who ate the, who drank the kind of chemical mix, which was just the kind of chemicals you're exposed to every day, were significantly more likely to become manic, have attention problems. Um, so you can see that the, there were so many factors that I learned about for my book, Stolen Focus, that I had never even thought of as related to attention. And of course, we, again, that's something that can be dealt with to some degree individually, but also, you know, the food industry you know, more 18 month old children know what the McDonald's M means than know their own last name. We are trained from the moment we're born to associate positive feelings with unhealthy food. So for that, there's again, a personal level and a way in which we have to take on the food industry. Agreed. And so, you know, in closing, everyone should pick up the book. It is such a well-researched and thorough book, but I, I'd love to give people some takeaways. So if you had to prioritize what are the, the three things that everyone should avoid or stop doing? And then what are the three things that, you know, we should do more of 
And so if I think, if we think of like the defense and offense, if you will, like what are the top three on each side that everyone today, no matter what, would probably benefit from doing? So there's so many, I mean, there's so many, I guess I would say switch tasks less. So tell the people, you know, a lot of people get annoyed if you don't text them back within five minutes. Could they go and text you a second to text me back? Explain to everyone you know, every time you're interrupted, like I said before, it takes 23 minutes to get back the level of focus. So when you want me to respond to your text, you're asking me for 23 minutes of my time. If that of my focus, if that text conversation happens over four hours, you've taken four hours of my focus, right? Even though it only felt like very small bursts. So start to establish as much as you can an etiquette around not replying immediately. So people know you're not going to do that and explain to them that's a gift of love from them to you, right? They are giving you back your ability to think deeply. I would recommend that. I would say buy a K-safe and I will not sit down with my boyfriend and watch a film unless we both put our phones in the K-safe, right? Because it just, it drives you crazy if you start just, you know, Googling. It only takes one of us to crack and we both crack. Uh, I would say if at all possible, sleep more. Do not look at artificial light for two hours before you go to sleep because it wakes you up. It causes a surge of energy. I can explain why if you want. Um, I would say read books. Reading books trains you to think in a deeper way. It retrains your focus. I would say join the Center for Humane Technology and other places that are fighting to regulate these companies because we've got to take them on. And I would also, I would say when you feel you can't focus, stop blaming yourself, right? And stop thinking the the solution is solely individual because, you know, the truth is we are not medieval peasants begging at the court of King Zuckerberg for a few little crumbs of attention from his table. We are the free citizens of democracies and we own our own minds and we can take them back if we want to individually and collectively, but we've got to stop blaming ourselves. They want us to blame ourselves. They tell us how much face time we spend so that you can go, oh my God, there's something wrong with me. I do four hours rather than going, what is wrong with them? What are they doing to us? How are they invading us? I go through all sorts of ways in the book in which the, the social, you know, and don't take my word for it. Sean Parker, one of the initial biggest investors in Facebook said, we designed it to maximally invade people's attention. We knew what we were doing and we did it anyway. God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. That's what he said. That's what they said. We now have leaked data from within Facebook. They know the harm they're doing. They're never going to stop unless we make them. But we can make them. There are all sorts of times in history when groups have been doing harmful things. And it doesn't mean we ban Facebook. It means we regulate the specific parts of Facebook. We force Facebook to be redesigned so that instead of hacking and destroying your attention, it can help to heal your attention. And obviously, I've talked to lots of people who, who've shown that. And uh, whenever I think of that, I think about something that an amazing man named Dr. James Williams, who was a senior Google strategist and quit because he was disgusted, said to me, you know, he said the axe existed for 1.4 million years before anyone thought to put a handle on it. The entire internet has existed for less than 10,000 days. We can change these things if we want to. We can take our brains back, but we've got to understand what's being done to us and we've got to get off our knees, stop blaming ourselves and start fighting back. Well said. Johan, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this, Jason. I meant to say, or I get tased by my publishers, that anyone who wants to um, know any more about the book, if they want to know where to get the audio book, the ebook, or the physical book, can go to stolenfocusbook.com. Also on the website, you can hear what lots of very prominent people from Hillary Clinton to Naomi Klein to Susan Cain have said about the book. You can, um, you, you can also listen to, for free to audio of clips of loads of the people that we've talked about. And I meant to say you can buy it in all good bookshops, but the truth is you can buy it in shitty bookshops as well if you want to. So yeah, stolenfocusbook.com. I love it. Thank you.